Okay, here we go. All right. Hello, everybody. It's Mr. Woodmancy again. Um, we're just going to, uh, some students had said that they would like to um, hear me go through the notes. I'll do the best I can. Obviously, it won't be quite as thorough as I'd normally like to do them. Uh, please ask questions um, in our discussion or feel free to email me if you have any questions. I do these on one, the first take. So uh, if there's mistakes and things, that's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to do my best. All right. So most of us, we already saw these notes here. Um, you know, the answer, of course, was imperialism, all those questions. Um, we talked about how many people who uh, don't like the United States today. They often claim the United States is an imperialist uh, nation. Um, and we said that that's something you're going to be deciding upon as you go through um, what exactly imperialism is and look at historical examples of it. Um, is that a fair way to, uh, you know, is it fair to describe the United States like that in the past or, or even today? Um, so that's something to be keeping in the back of your mind. All right. So we looked at kind of where imperialism was when it was happening. And all these notes, by the way, are, are linked uh, on the week one web page. So if I'm going too fast and you want to look at them, uh, you're welcome to. But we start off looking at, okay, politically, socially, economically, countries can imperialize other countries. Um, it can be a total control or it can just be um, an influence, right? So some political reasons people would uh, do this are for security. Uh, one country might take over another country um, to control pieces of land, hurt an enemy uh, that's trying to take that land, trying to block them. Um, I don't know if you remember this German historian we listened to, uh, but he said something like this, all great nations in the fullness of their strength have desired to set their mark upon bear, 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 bear. Okay, maybe I should edit this. Barbarian lands and those who fail to participate in this great rivalry play a pitiable role in time to come. German historian. So we said that's just the idea that if you want to be a powerful country, you needed to take land. Um, kind of like we were talking about silly bands uh, in the past. We said, like, if you wanted to be a cool kid, you had the silly bands that went all the way up the, your arm. The more silly bands you control had, the better, the cooler you were. Okay, this, but during this time, it was more, the more land you had, the more land you could claim. If you remember, we talked about how Great Britain actually controlled about 23% of the land at this time. So I guess they were pretty cool. Um, at least in their own minds. Uh, so, and that leads us to our third one, just kind of like, you know, the, a country's rep, uh, their prestige, uh, that their nationalism, their pride in the country. The sun never sets on the British Empire. If you remember that, um, you can see the sun here. Uh, and as it goes across the land, do, 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 do. I can't move it. Sorry. I'm sure there's some way to do this, but I don't know. So, imagination. Okay. So, here we go. Do, 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 do. It's moving. It's going to be covering uh, the red territory all the time somewhere, and that is the British territory. And then just government manipulation, going in and saying, I don't like your government. Um, you are a dictator and bad, and we want to help overthrow you. Um, that would be another example. Okay, continuing. Economic reasons. And important to note here, if you look at this, it's not shocking that these were the economic reasons following the Industrial Revolution, because guess why they needed more raw materials? Because they were producing things so much quicker that they're running out of the raw materials to say, produce a shirt, 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 shirt. Remember all the shirts? They're running out of materials. So, hey, where could they get it? They could go to India and get the cotton, right? Um, let's go to India and take the cotton from the people from the people in India. Uh, but then they were needed labor. They needed labor. You remember our workers? They needed workers to extract that raw material. And so the Industrial Revolution is really fueling imperialism. Um, and so it's not a surprise that it comes historically speaking, kind of at that uh, at the end of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then new markets. Once they make all these shirts, hey, who's going to buy them? We've sold them to all the people in Great Britain. I know. Let's sell them to the India, the people of India. 
or the people of peoples in different areas they controlled in Africa. Um, and of course, the irony there, sad irony, cruel irony, is the fact that those are some of the very people who, had, who helped get the raw materials to give to the British or other imperialist countries to sell back to them. Um, so really, they were getting kind of ripped off multiple ways. And you might ask yourself, self, why would I buy a shirt from Great Britain if they are controlling our country? I'm, from, I'm pretending I'm from India here. My country's being controlled by them. They force me to take cotton and then they take it and sell and make shirts out of it and make profit off of it. Why would you buy a shirt? Why wouldn't I just buy a shirt from India? Um, well, the reason is because these machines that, you know, these factories during the Industrial Revolution, we know could make goods cheaper and faster um, and just higher quality. Um, you know, and so typically people think what's going to benefit me right now. And um, they're not thinking of the overall um, message that it's sending if they buy that good. It, it takes a, a really strong person to get people to see a vision of the problems that it's causing, uh, the co that's causing you. And so, spoiler alert, there's going to be one in India who helps try to show that. British goods are bad and what they're doing to the Indian people. His name begins with a G. That was pausing for you to think. Hmm. I think you figured it out. If not, you'll learn later. Okay, let's move on. So um, the Industrial Revolution really kind of pushed this. I spent a lot of time on saying that because you might see it again. Okay, moving on. The social. This is where it gets really aggravating. This is like, <clears throat> I mean, it's all aggravating, uh, really, the whole idea and concept of imperialism, but this is where it just gets kind of nasty. Um, the idea that they're going to civilize other people around the world, that they're better than other people around the world, that they have that view, hey, we're better than uh, the areas we're going to. We, you know, we said the areas that got imperialized were Africa. You know, much of Asia, whether it be India, China, Japan, and it was the European countries primarily who were doing this, um, that they felt, hey, we're, we're, we're more civilized than these other areas. As a matter of fact, um, there's a poem that really represents this. It's called The White Man's Burden. And a burden, what's a burden, everyone? All at once now. On three, one, two, three, what is it? What's a burden? If I said, what's a burden for you? It might be this video. I hope it, <laughs> I hope it isn't, but uh, it, it might be like, it's basically something that, um, atta like something that is difficult that you have to uh, carry, like weight on your shoulders. Like it's a heavy burden. It's a heavy thing to carry. So what is, what is the white man's burden? What's so tough for the white man? What is their responsibility, this heavy responsibility that they have to carry? We're going to find out what they thought that was, but it has to do with civilizing. So maybe you've kind of put those two points together. Now, who is this Rudyard Kipling guy? Maybe you've heard of him. He was a super famous um, author. Uh, who actually was born in India, uh, but of British heritage, who ended up going to school in Britain. And uh, he believed that imperialism served the purpose of civilizing um, and was beneficial to the people that it imperialized, um, which, you know, most people today would say that that is not the case whatsoever, but that's what he believed in. And uh, he wrote some really famous books, uh, Kim, Gunga Din, think is another one. I may have just made that up. Uh, but the one I'm not is the one I, that you're probably most familiar with is, let me give you the song, see if you can figure it out. Dun, 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 you know, I realized that now you have this weird recording and I should probably not do that, but too late, one take, so you got it. Does anyone figure out what that is? It's the Bare Necessities from the Jungle Book. So he actually wrote the Jungle Book um, as well. But let's see what this poem, uh, White Man's Burden, which was really very symbolic of imperialism in general, is all about. We're going to have to skip over a little bit here. Here it is. Oops. 
All right. And I said, this mindset is so sickening. Um, and let's see if you agree. So it's, oh wait, this isn't it at all. Okay. Oops. Where did it go? I have totally lost it. But I had it here. Well, fortunately we're in luck because I kind of have some of it memorized. Maybe I put it later. I don't, I don't know. All right. Well, I'll just have to read it to you, I guess. So, um, from my memory and <laughs> Let's click the button. Oh, wait, that doesn't work. All right, so uh, the poem goes, Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captive's need. Okay, that's all I can remember. Let's see if I can pause this real quick. I can't. So maybe I'll... Um, you know what? Why not? Hey, let's see if I have something here. Why not just look it up? We can do it, right? You guys be patient while I look it up real quickly. Here's something about the white man's burden, but that's not what I'm looking at. Let me just look it up real quick. Okay, here we go. Magic of technology. Ooh, can't use Wikipedia. Sorry, you know. Um, here we go. Let's see this. Okay, here it is. Let me blow this up for you. Um, do, do, do. This is from an educational website uh, from a university. So, hey, I think that passes the crap test. Plus, I know the poem, so it's just a matter of me remembering it all. Okay, let's see how close I was. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go send your sons to exile to serve your captive's need. So there's the key right there, to serve your captive's need. Okay, this is where he is basically saying, oh, you're doing, you're doing a benefit to the people. You're helping them. When in reality, we're going to see as we go through this lesson that they're not being helped at all. To wait in heavy harness, unfluttered folk and wide, wild, your new caught sullen peoples. And this is the line that just starts my blood boiling. I don't know if you can hear a boiling through the computer, but it's boiling. Half devil, half child. So he describes the new cut sullen people, these, these people that were imperialized as half devil and half children. And that's where we hear a term like barbarian a lot when we're looking at um, imperialism. And when you look at, this is a nice little um, quick synopsis of why he sent the poem. Interestingly enough, he sent the white man's burden, which was kind of like, here's some, here's a, let me help you. He's sending this to a country telling them, let me help you. Let me give you some advice. Uh, now that you're, that you're becoming an imperialist, like, uh, us, great Britain, once you're, we're becoming a, an imperialist nation, let me give you some advice. And the nation he's sending this to is actually the United States of America. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. Because at this time, the United States of America was doing things that could be certainly looked at as imperialistic. Uh, they had fought in the Spanish-American War. I'm sure it says this somewhere, or maybe not on the screen, but it's true. Um, in 1899, um, and they had helped defeat the Spanish and kick them out of the, the Americas. Um, and But in doing so, um, they had just uh, ratified a treaty that gave them Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and the Philippines became under U.S. control. So that's where um, he ended up going. Uh, Rudyard Kipling was like, oh, now you have all these people that you've captured. Now you're like us, you know, not as cool as the British because we have more land. But, you know, let us help you out. You're like a little you're, we'll, we'll help you out and give you some advice. And so this is also, and this is a little known war, and we might have time to look at it more. We'll see. But if you should check it out, it's the Philippine-American War. It's a war that most people have no idea about um, that took place in the Philippines. And there's a reason most people don't know about it. It doesn't exactly... It's not the best moment in the United States history, uh, although the U.S. has had so many, many moments of amazing things and done great things. Uh, this is one that if you do uh, go out and be a lifelong owner here, check it out a little bit and see. It's just um, it wasn't exactly uh, the United States' best moment. Uh, we'll put it that way. So um, anyhow, that's the poem White Man's Burden. It's basically saying the U.S.'s burden is to take care of their people. But again, he described their people that they're now in control of in Guam, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines as half devil, half children. Okay. 
Moving on, uh, missionary work. Whoa, missionary work is the idea that um, they're wanting to spread their religion. Now, probably a lot of your families or friends or people you know um, do missionary work today. I have plenty of students who do it, but the missionary work from back then was much different. You know, some of it was like it is today and was sharing uh, with their beliefs and trying to help people hear that message. But for many of the people who went, it was more like our way is right, your way is wrong, listen to us, and more controlling, um, more kind of dominating, um, as opposed to um, exposing to and and giving access to, uh, just a little bit different. And so uh, that's missionary work. The third one is racism. And I know some of we've already talked to this, but some of you, we talked about what social Darwinism is. Um, social Darwinism, Charles Darwin is the one who came up um, with the idea of evolution and survival of the fittest and things like that. Um, sadly, people took that idea of survival of the fittest and evolution from science and said, you know, if you can apply this to the Galapagos turtles um, or those marine lizards or, or the birds on the Galapagos Islands, then uh, they thought that you could apply that to race. And uh, shocking, who did the who did the British think was the, the best? Uh, well, they thought they were the most evolved. Um, that's where this quote, um, I contend that we Britons comes in. And I know a few of you have already seen that. So um, but here, I'll put it down here. This is so you can see it better. I contend that we Britons are the finest race in the world. And the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. I mean, can you imagine someone saying this today? Um, it does show how far along we have come uh, in the world. Although, sadly, there are still people who hold this uh, this idea. Uh, it's clearly uh, there in the severe minority today um, versus, you know, um, it's definitely changed a lot, but this was just kind of what people thought back then. It says it is our duty duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory. And we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes that the more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, most honorable race the world possesses to say the most human. Oh my, come on. Who is this guy? Uh, Cecil Rhodes or Cecil Rhodes, whichever you prefer. Um, this guy is super famous. Um, he controlled a lot of land uh, in Africa. He wanted to build a railroad from Cape Town to Cairo. Um, and very interestingly enough, there's a major award named after him today. Um, it's called the Rhodes scholar and there are very few handed out this is act and it's a i mean i'm talking super prestigious uh, very few uh, u.s citizens get this opportunity and they go study in england um and but it's named after this guy who was clearly a racist so it's kind of interesting uh and especially this is really fascinating um this is a this is someone who got the uh Rhodes Scholar. Actually, I think there was a girl from Dublin, Scioto, maybe that got a Rhodes Scholar. Um, I, I could have made that up. Maybe it was, maybe it was Ohio State. But anyhow, um, this just shows, oh yeah, there it is. It's very small. I don't know if you can see it, but because it, I was trying to hide it to make, to save it to show you, but it, it says Dublin graduated from Ohio State University, May 2018. So who knows? You might be able to look into that more, but maybe one day one of you will be a Rhodes Scholar. And then I can put your face on here and say, I, I know this famous person. Um, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, former uh, former U.S. president, Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. And there, uh, Bill Bradley was a basketball player. There's a bunch of people who are famous. All right. Now, don't color in the percentage of Africa you think was taken by Europe by 1870, because then you would be drawing all over your Chromebooks. And I think that would be bad. But in your mind, color what percentage of Africa you think should be colored in. And in your mind, think, hey, what areas should be colored in? So by 1870, so this would be after the U.S. Civil War, how much of Africa do you think was controlled by Europe? Typically, I get answers anywhere from 70 to 100 percent are probably the most popular ones. Um, but their answer is, let's look. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, this is 1878, so there it is. 
Now, of course, this is missing something that's really important, and that is a key, so we don't really know what this means yet. What's the brown represent? What does the pink represent? Well, what that represents, this brownish color here, I guess that's why I don't know if that's what it looks like on your screen. That's actually what the Africans controlled. So in 1878, most of Africa was controlled by Africans. Uh, you see that there are little pockets that are controlled by Europeans. Um, and then this is the Ottoman Empire was up here for a while. Um, and so, but so that wasn't even European, although the Ottoman Empire, you could argue, was both, was not only from Asia, but also was from Europe and Africa, but they started more in kind of Asia and spread into Europe. But anyhow, that's too much information, I know. But so anyhow, this brown area, that's shocking. That shocked me the first time I saw that, because when I was a kid, um, now granted, you're a lot brighter than I was, but when I was a kid, I just thought, oh, slavery. Of course, most of Africa was controlled by this point. I just thought the Europeans had taken over and but no, they had not. By 1870, kids, 1878, Europe barely controlled any of Africa. The question is why? Did they not want Africa? Did they not see value in Africa? No, they saw value. They wanted it. They couldn't. They couldn't take it. So the question is, well, why couldn't they take it? I thought Europe was this like, had you know, but with that, I contend we Britons thing we heard. Uh, I thought they were like this master group at this point. Well, not yet. The Europeans had not, they, they are going to get an advantage, but up to this point in history, they didn't have that big of an advantage, if at any at all. As a matter of fact, there have been times in history where Europe had tried to take over, um, to take over Africa, and we're going to see they failed. Now, um, remember when I asked you to like, what's one word to describe Africa? Uh, we had all different kinds, and most of them were like, um, you know, hot, desert. Then someone would say water. Like there was just, and those are all fine answers, but it was just like all these different things. Well, if you remember, I said the word I would use is diverse. And remember how big I showed you that Africa truly was. Here are some other things. This was a year when I went ahead and put up what other kids were thinking. Um, and this was actually three teachers that I asked. So now they weren't history teachers, but, you know, this gives you an idea that, you know, um, that people have these stereotypes of Africa. Um, and, you know, some of these things are true uh, in some areas, but not, I mean, there clearly there's poverty in some areas of Africa, but then there's areas that actually are doing well and are very modern as we, as we learned uh, earlier. Um, so just kind of interesting thing there. We'll kind of move on. So listen, less than 10% of Africa was controlled by Europe before imperialism happened. There were thousands of languages in Africa. That's why I say it's diverse. Um, there were hundreds of ethnic groups. There's a variety of religious beliefs. There were small tribes. This is true. A lot of times kids will say, oh, well, uh, I consider it tribal, uh, tribes. And that's true. There, there are tribes in Africa, just like it, in 1878. I don't know if you know this. There were tribes in North America as well. No. Yeah. So that was still a uh, time when, uh, when there were still tribes in, in the United States states. I mean, really there still are today, if you think about it in some ways, but, um, not to the extent that people think obviously with Africa, with more remote tribes and there was, there was some of that, but what people don't realize is there were also powerful nations in Africa, um, nations of 10 million people. I mean, we're not talking like small nations, big ones. Now, again, it was, there was, a, there was a variety. Africa's massive. So in certain areas of Africa, there were more nations in other areas of Africa. There were, were more tribal areas. It just kind of depend on how much contact they had and trade and a lot of geographical uh, um, things as well. Okay, moving on. All right, religious breakdown of Africa. This is just kind of interesting. I put the three different colors represent three different religions where they are the majority religion in that country. And I know I can't move this. Normally I can, but you can kind of get an idea. This is actually the Middle East. This is uh, Mecca. And if you know the Middle East, which I hope you do, and Mecca being in Saudi Arabia, that's where Islam um, kind of originated from. So the red is actually Islam, and it shows how it spread into North Africa. 
Now you notice it kind of stops here. Not that there aren't people who practice Islam, there are uh, in these areas, but this is where they are a, a majority. So what kind of stopped it? Well, right here, this is the Sahara Desert. So again, it shows how geography plays a role in these things. Um, the blue represents Christianity. Uh, and so you have Christianity there, and then the green represents indigenous beliefs. So it's just kind of interesting looking at um, the differences in Africa. Um, you see some red along the coast because that was from trading from the Middle East. A lot of trade went down this way. So just kind of showing the diversity of religions as well. Um, here showing the ethnic breakdowns of Africa um, and looking at all those borders. So there you go, just hundreds of ethnic groups. Uh, and then, oh, okay, a statistical look at Africa today. So we're gonna say, okay, so back then it was diverse, there was a lot going on, there were powerful kingdoms, there was wealthy kingdoms. Let's take a look, uh, let, we'll do this together here. We're gonna go to CIA.gov, and we're gonna take a look at GDP per capita. And I know some of you have already looked at this, but, we're going to look at it together. Okay, World Factbook. All right. By the way, if you need to take a break, if you find yourself dozing off at any point because I'm blabbing, you can pause this, go take a break, go get a snack, get a drink, uh, check your phone. I hope none of you had your phones on you during this time. Just some advice. Just turn your phone off, get it away from you while we're going over this because I know how it is. You know, you're looking at the screen, you're hearing me talk, um, and it's just talk, 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 because that's all we can do, that it would be really easy to kind of, oh, let me check my phone while I'm doing this. Don't do it, okay? Put the phone far away. I see some of you having guilty looks on your face. I can sense it, yeah. So uh, don't make me bring around their little phone spa and collect them from everyone before our next lesson. So go ahead and put those away when we're doing this. All right, let's get into uh, Africa. Let's look at their GDP per capita. Okay, here we go, do, 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 oh. Okay, GDP per capita. If we go to the GDP per capita of countries in Africa, I think you could all kind of predict, remember when we stood in line and we did that lineup, um, you can probably predict how this is gonna go. So let me maybe blow this up a little bit. Here we go. All right, so if we're looking at the bottom countries in, Af or in the world, we go all the way down and we take a look at who's down there. Um, let me, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so if we go down here, Central African Republic, Africa. Next one, Burundi, Africa. Africa. Don't that's this is an island so we won't count that. Uh, then Africa. Africa, 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 not Africa. Not Africa. Africa, Africa, and then not Africa, Africa, but we see that a lot of the bottoms of the GDP per capita is actually from Africa. And so you might be asking yourself, well, why is that? Is that, I thought you just said not everyone is uh, impoverished and that's true, but this shows there is still a lot of poverty in Africa and a lot of um, situations with wealth um, gaps in Africa. And the answer is a word that I just hate to even mention as to one of the reasons why this is the case. And I don't want to mention it because it's, it's a potty word. It starts with an I. It ends in ism. Imperialism. You're right. That's going to be one of the reasons that this happens. All right. So let's take, oh, oh boy. Okay, let's take a look at one more thing and then we'll move on. And that is life expectancy. Okay, people in society. This is really hard talking this long. I really want to drink real badly because um, I'm getting parched here. All right. Uh, do, do, do. I think I probably went by it and you're all yelling at me because you saw it. Maybe I didn't. Okay, come on, life expectancy. No, that was median age. It must be, I was right, it was a little bit lower. Okay, oh, here we are. Okay, so let's see how they're doing with, now, we know when you have a low GDP per capita, it typically means you have a low um, life expectancy as well. Let's see if this is the case. All right, so, oh, wow. All right, so the, and, uh, the lowest one in the world actually isn't from Africa. 
Afghanistan, 52.80. Uh, you know, that's really low, but let's see if the rat, but that wasn't one of, that actually was one of the lower GDP per capita. So it makes sense. So let's look Africa, 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 not Africa. So you get the idea. So again, you know, what's what's the reason for that? Well, again, if we look at it, the reason is obviously imperialism is going to lead to that. And the other is disease. There's a lot of uh, disease in Africa, and we're going to talk more about that later. So um, those are two of the big reasons. And that kind of connects with um, Africa today. Okay, I need to take a drink of water. I'm going to not be able to get through this. All right. So why did Europe have a hard time taking over Africa before 1878? Certainly Europe and Africa had been fighting all the way, all you Roman historians, the Punic Wars uh, between Rome and Carthage. I mean, there'd been a history of fighting there. Or, um, you know, Alexander the Great uh, with the Macedonians and um, Egypt. And so there'd been a history of contact and fighting. Why hadn't they taken over more? Well, one, the environment, right? The environment in Africa can be challenging in some areas. There's massive deserts, there's open savannas, but then there's mountainous regions. There's um, more, what we, the typical jungle that a lot of people stereotype um, Africa with. Um, and so, and there's, you know, there's a lot of animals. Um, that, if you're not from that region, can be a bit tricky. If you're a European trying to walk around in there, it could be challenging. Um, harsh diseases uh, like malaria we're going to talk about. And then the one that no one ever thinks of, strong nations. But there were, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to give you evidence. I'm going to show you, not tell you. Okay, so here we go. Um, here's just an example terrain in the environment. You see that there's the different terrains I was talking about. You can see some of the beautiful, um, you know, things, Victoria Falls and uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and Sahara Desert and things like that. And then the animals, this is always fun to look at, which one of these is most deadly. Okay, the answer is actually this one right here. This is the mosquito. It actually killed a lot more now than all these other ones combined. The mosquito uh, carried, it didn't just like suck everyone's blood enough that they died. It's just that they put uh, diseases into people like malaria. These two lions are super interesting. Um, they actually ate a number of people in Africa. It's a really famous story. There was a movie called The Ghost in the Darkness, which maybe I'll give you a link to the trailer because it's kind of it was kind of like the Jaws shark movie of its time, except with lions. And um, both lions were actually killed. This is one of them um, after they were hunted for a while. Both of these lions are in the Chicago Field Museum, which I was hoping to see during spring break. And I was going to be with a bunch of you on that field trip as a chaperone with my son. However, uh, sadly, we couldn't go. But I hope one day you get to go to the Chicago Field Museum, take a look at them. They're really interesting. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the mosquito is, is extremely dangerous. <coughs> okay. Oh, hey, there's a mosquito. Um, that has killed so many people uh, by the transmission of diseases. Uh, here's some facts about malaria. Um, this actually is a good site, gives a tons of facts about malaria. Um, and uh, maybe I'll link these to you later. I don't know. We'll see if I have, I don't want to put too much on this first one because I don't want to overwhelm you, but some really good facts about malaria and sadly how many children die from it. Um, but things that can help with it are mosquito nets. They're very cheap. Um, and last in a couple of years, actually, some of my students who have lived in Africa talk about using them when they were in Africa. Um, and then this is hope. Um, Bill Gates, his goal is to get rid of malaria and to make sure that it just disappears from the world. Uh, most of the countries in yellow down here are the ones where you see malaria more. We don't really see it in the United States because of just where we are in the world. Okay. <coughs> okay. Oh, by the way, this, here's the good news. Global malaria rates have clearly declined, uh, but if you look, 
These are deaths. This is 500,000 deaths still, or a little less than that, but in the, and that was 2015 in the world. So that's a lot of people, but look how high it was just in 2000. Now imagine 1800s. Think how high that would have been. But you'll notice all these are going down. But even though Africa has gone down sharply, I mean, it's gone down a lot. You'll see the um, that there's still, you know, a massive amount of the deaths come in Africa. So malaria is a big problem there. So that made it difficult for the Europeans to go in there. Okay, next one, strong nations. There's so many cool, strong African nations. I wish I had time uh, to go through them all. Um, here's some pictures of them. I'll try to put some links with some more information um, and possibly in our um, Google Doc. Um, here's an example of one of them, though. Uh, you had Portugal um, versus uh Portugal versus Morocco in 1578. Uh, the Portuguese attacked. It was called uh, the. I'm sure I'm not doing the name right, but Battle of Alcacer Kabir, um, and King Sebastian the First of Portugal decided to attack Morocco. He had 25,000 troops. Here he is. He actually led the attack himself, and um, in doing so, everyone's like, "Oh, the you know." The Portuguese are going to win. We got our king with us. And it was a huge disaster for the Portuguese, actually. Uh, they basically got wiped out. Um, 9,000 Portuguese were uh, killed, around 9,000. There were around 16,000 prisoners taken. If you add that up, that's right around that 25,000. And less than 100 actually escaped. So the Portuguese in the you know, you know 16th century, they... Barely a hundred people escaped. It was like their entire nobility. It really hurts Portugal, um, and their and their strength as a nation. And what about the king? The king never is seen again. No one even knows what happened to him. Um, was was he killed on the battlefield? Was he made a slave? We don't know. Some people said he would come back one day to lead Portugal. They're still waiting. So he he most likely died, but who knows? He never came back and. Imagine if our president were to lead our army and just disappear and almost all of our troops be taken or killed. You can imagine how that would impact the country. Moving on. There are strong nations I want to mention. You know, you got Great Zimbabwe, also known as Monomotapa. <clears throat> there was all kinds of great kingdoms here because this is where the salt trade and trading would go come from northern Africa through the Sahara to this region. They had tons of gold. Um the Ashante, for example, just tons of gold. Um, the Song High. I mean, there were just a ton of really interesting empires. I wish we had more time to go into. There's Great Zimbabwe. But you see the majority of the major empires were up in this region, um, you know, near the Mediterranean here, um, and then in this trading area as well. Um, lesser major kingdoms down there, but still interesting ones nonetheless. You have the Zulus, super fascinating, Benin and their um, their art, uh, their metalworking. This is um, a picture of an Asante um, city. I don't know if you can see it, but it's it was massive. A lot of people lived there. <coughs> this is the Golden Stool, uh, which is really famous um, for the Asante. Uh, so just get you a little bit of an idea. Now. Look at Africa in 1913, though. We said this is Africa in 1878. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they couldn't be taken over. They had too many strong nations. They had these diseases. They had animals. They had harsh areas. So people couldn't get in all the way in. You know, when they were doing slavery, the Africans would, the Europeans would buy a lot of their slaves from other Africans because they were fighting with one another and then they could sell uh, their captives to the Europeans. So the Europeans weren't going, very few were going very far into the heart of Africa. They were taking slaves from these regions and taking slaves from other Africans as well. So <coughs> um, they hadn't gone in. So think about that. Hundreds of years, not getting in, not getting in, not getting in, not getting in, not getting in. Then all of a sudden, between 1878 and 1913, they take over all of Africa, literally all of it. 
uh, except for Liberia and Ethiopia. Those were the only two places not taken over. And Liberia, that's because the United States kind of sponsored that region for, they thought that that would be a good place for um, Africans from the United States. They were in the United States and uh, just slaves and their descendants who had come from Africa. They thought that would be a good colony for them to have. And then they would all go back to this area and have a colony, which was kind of ridiculous considering the slaves were from all over Af many different areas in Africa, but that's why um, Monrovia is the capital today. They still uh, they have that heritage. That's really an interesting story too. I wish we could go into that more. I um, wish we had time, but this this virus is not making it easy. Okay, so <clears throat> anyhow, Ethiopia. We'll find out why they were able to not be taken over. But literally, the rest of Africa was taken over by um, the Europeans. It's kind of crazy. What gave them that advantage? What allowed them to take all that over? By the way, here are the countries. I should have made you guess. What different? You can look at this for a second. What different areas were controlled by what different regions of Europe? Uh, was the U.S. in there? Well, let's see. So Belgium here, which we're going to talk about that later uh, this week. Great Britain was this kind of tomatoey looking country. Look how much our color. Look how much they controlled. France controlled this lighter color. Germany. Now, why are these all? Why would you have this little area of Germany, and then they're over here, and then they're here? What is the deal with this? Why aren't these in more organized fashion? Over here, you have Portugal. Over here, you have Portugal. You've got Italy. Italy. Oh, um, Italy up here, you got Spain here, Spain here. Look, then you got Portugal over here. Why is this? There's a really important reason for this we're going to look at later. And the U.S., the U.S. was not there at all. Um, they were not in Africa at all. Okay, this we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about this later. Um, U.S. and was it an imperialist nation. And you're actually going to go into that next year. So I don't want to spoil that too much, um, but we are going to talk about it. Um, here is the whole area of, uh, of Africa and Asia, which we're going to be doing that map quiz um, week three. Um, you can see how much of it was actually controlled by Europe, a ton. Now, there we do see the United States. You can see if you can find anywhere on here that the U.S. controlled. You can look at it in your notes. All right, and that's it for today. So good job, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope that made sense. We'll see how it goes. I know it's a little dry, me just talking about it, but um, hopefully it was able to hold your attention. I super appreciate it. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, take the quiz, the mastery assessment after this. Um, on this, this note section, you can um, take it once with no notes like usual. Second time, you can use your notes. You can go back and listen to this whole castify if you want you can look things up on the internet you can email me you can ask questions you can ask a history buddy just don't ask them what the answer is have them teach it to you okay so good luck and thanks for listening bye